My name is Anne Rose. I'm a museum coordinator at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum. I want to welcome you to CXC 2020. We'll get started in a few moments with the panel Drawing Power, Comics, Trauma, and Reclamation. But first, we want to thank our sponsors. We couldn't do this without them because of their generous support from places like the Ohio Arts Council, Greater Columbus Arts Council, and White Castle. We're able to provide this content to you for free. So thank you so much. A few housekeeping tips if you're new to Zoom. We want to go over just a few things to show you how you can participate in this panel today. So this presentation is followed by a Q&A. You'll have time to ask questions to the panelists. You have been automatically muted by the host and your video is off. This presentation is being recorded and it is also being simulcast on the CXC website, YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook. And here's what you're gonna have access to. You can adjust your audio settings at the bottom left of your screen. Chat, you can talk to host and other attendees by typing in chat. You'll be able to raise your hand, give feedback to questions by raising your hand if asked by the panelists. And you can submit questions for the presenters in the Q&A tool. So here's what that's gonna look like on your screen. The audio settings are on the bottom left. You just click that arrow if you need to adjust anything. And the chat box is in the center. If you wanna raise your hand, you're gonna click that. It's gonna turn green, lower your hand, click it again. Q&A box, if you click that, it's gonna open your box. If you want to send a question anonymously to the panelists, you can check the send anonymously. You're gonna type your question in that little comment area and then hit the blue send button and your question will show up to the panelists. So thank you. I'm gonna hand it off to our moderator, Caitlin McGurk. Okay. Welcome everyone. I'm Caitlin McGurk, Associate Curator and Assistant Professor at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum. I've been very much looking forward to this panel because I think that Drawing Power is one of the most important comics anthologies I have ever come across. Inspired by the Me Too movement and dedicated to Anita Hill, Drawing Power is a hefty 260 page testimony of the all too relatable experiences of being a woman in a world where our bodies are treated as belonging to others and not us. The editor, Diane Newman, is a cartoonist luminary, the creator of Dee Dee Glitz, editor of the legendary Twisted Sisters anthology, and contributor to women's comics. And as officially announced last night at our reception, Diane Newman is the winner of this year's CXC Master Cartoonist Award. Congratulations, Diane. Thank you so much. <laughs> With drawing power, Newman gathered stories from over 60 women of varying age, race, nationality, religion, and sexuality an impressive feat in itself, which I look forward to finding out more about this afternoon. Drawing Power is a book that should not have to exist, but I am so glad that it does. It is not an easy read, but it's an essential read. As a survivor of rape and countless sexual aggressions from micro to macro, for me, Drawing Power is both a reassurance that we are not alone, that this is not our fault, and a call to, our, to arms for just how prevalent these experiences are and how this must stop. We're talking a lot about pandemics and epidemics these days, and sexual assault is both. Drawing power is all of the proof that you need to know that. As Diane writes in her introduction to the book, out of all of the women that she approached to contribute, which is probably upwards of 100, only one of them said that she had never had such an experience. I want to also welcome and thank our panelists for joining us today, the contributors to Drawing Power, Carter Monier, Dr. Ebony Flowers, and Joyce Farmer. Carta is a cartoonist, publisher, and pornographer living in Ann Arbor, Michigan. She's a past recipient of the CXC Emerging Talent Award. Ebony Flowers is an ethnographer and the creator of the highly acclaimed graphic novel, Hot Comb, which most recently won an Ignatz Awards for Outstanding Graphic Novel and an Eisner Award for Best Short Story. Joyce Farmer is a personal hero of mine and the co-editor of Tits and Clits from 1972 to 1987, as well as Abortion Eve, two of the most important contributions to comics history, in my opinion, and the creator of the deeply moving graphic novel memoir, Special Exits. So thank you all for being here. I want to mention to everyone watching today that due to the nature of the subject of drawing power, some of the material in this talk may not be suitable for all audiences, and it also may be upsetting. So please take care of yourself while you're listening to this and do step away if you need to. So hi, everybody. <laughs> 
Um, I'm going to get started with a few questions that are specifically for Diane as the editor. So Diane, can you tell us about what led you to decide to create Drawing Power? Well, it's kind of like in the story that I did for this book. This book is all personal stories of specific things that had happened to them, except for me, because I felt I had to explain why I did the book. And it was just, you know, Trump saying, when you're a star, you can do anything. You can grab him by the pussy. And so that's why I called my story Grab him by the Pussy. And it was a culmination. You know, it was, it was, you know, day after day, there was a new celebrity um, assailant, you know. <laughs> and I, I just thought, okay, the only thing, I felt really frustrated. And then I thought the only thing I could do is do a book because I'm a cartoonist and I've been an editor. And I really didn't know quite what I was getting into when I started this. Um, I kept pushing for more pages and more authors with Abrams. They were very good. They were pretty much let me do what I needed to do. Um, and that was, and you know, it was a big job. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I got them to do the things like send out the checks and figure that out. You know, because. Like for Twisted Sisters, I had to do that. <laughs> but yeah. it was only two artists, you know. So I found that even just starting this book, I started to get memories of things that I had completely repressed or forgotten, like at the time I had to fight off a rapist and friend, you know, and in some ways, I wish I had done that kind of a story, but I just felt this was important to me to do it this way. So. Yeah. How did you, you know, I was astounded when reading this, how many cartoonists in here I was being introduced to for the first time. And as, as it, I mentioned in the introduction, people from all over the world. Uh, I'm really curious about, you know, how did you go about identifying the artists for inclusion? You know, what was, what was the call uh, for submissions like, or was it invitation based? There was, no there was no call for submissions. I wrote individually to cartoonists that I liked the work of and wanted to be in the book, you know, and then within that, I wanted to have a variety, like you said, a really big variety, because I, I really hate when they talk about the first wave of feminism and the second wave and the third wave and you know, we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. We may have a different approach, but it's still important to recognize that. And I used Instagram. Nice. <laughs> and uh, Mary Naomi, who's one of the contributors to the book, is had put up this um, website that was listing um, cartoonists from other countries, other ethnicities, and also gay women, and and also from a lot of different countries. So that's that sort of really helped me. But basically, it was okay. I've this is a person I never heard of, or I've seen their work on Instagram, and I'm going to look at all their work that I can find, and then if I like it, I ask them to do a story. That's phenomenal. And for those watching who aren't familiar, uh, those databases that Diane refers to are the Cartoonist of Color database. Uh, I think Mari also made the Queer Cartoonist database and recently debuted a Disabled Cartoonist database. These are incredible resources. So I think that's a fantastic way of, of going about this. Um, did you have specific criteria for the submissions that you were you know, soliciting from people or uh, certain parameters that you gave them, page count, that kind of thing? In the beginning, I I let people pick out how many pages they would do. As it got tighter, I had to assign a, a page count, you know. Having 62 artists, I had no idea that I was going to wind up with that many, you know. And it was really important to me. I wanted, I would have liked to get artists who didn't speak English and have them translated, but um that would have delayed the book too much for Abrams and 
been very expensive. So we didn't do that. I, I still found many English speaking people in, in other countries. And um, that was a big part of it, you know. So they were given total freedom to kind of structure the story? Well, within within a page count sometimes, yes, total freedom. The only thing that I did was if I felt confused by the continuity or I saw rough from some people and if I couldn't follow it, then I would ask them, can they make this more clear or something like that? I really did not talk about the art ever. Yeah. I mean, these are people who are artists and I respected them as artists and I didn't feel any need to control them. Um, I was really glad that there were people, there were artists who did really in your face work mm -hmm. and her life, like Mr. Stevenson was really one of my favorite. And I think that some people did it a more indirect approach, like walking in the park with their daughter and seeing somebody exposing themselves. And, and you know, I like that there were all these different approaches. Yeah, and that's something that really struck me is that it <laughs> runs the whole unfortunately colorful gamut of harassment when you read this. You know, there's all these things of, yeah, someone exposing someone or some, you know, what someone might qualify as a microaggression. So then, of course, really horrific, uh, you know, graphic incidents. And was that, did you even have to try to strike a balance of the kinds of stories or it just kind of naturally ended up this way? What I did was, it naturally was that way. You know, I didn't tell people, I felt people needed the freedom to approach this incredibly difficult subject their own way. That was really important. So some people, you know, did it real in your face, like Lee Mars. <laughs> um, that's really a difficult one. And so I forgot what question you asked. Me. Oh, no, that's Sorry. okay. I was just amazed by the, by the balance that was struck in the various types of stories that were told. And it's that, that's in the figuring out the, the um, how, where the pages went, where yeah. the stories went. That was taken into account, um, trying to sort of pace the really, uh, not putting all together of one type, you know? Yeah. And uh, also some more colors, some black and white. Um, and I, I think that the way you did that was, it's just incredibly well done. And someone, when we were just getting started for this panel mentioned, having a friend who can't was not able to read the book all at once. And I'm definitely one of those people. I had to take my time with it. You know, it's not uh, an easy thing to sit down and <laughs> read all in one sitting. Uh, so I think striking that balance with uh, the way the, the way the stories are structured within the book is really important. Um, I'm curious about how much freedom you were given by the publisher and, you know, was there any pushback or any kind of, yeah, I'd love to just hear more about that. Well, I had to fight more about um, getting a contract where I could actually pay people as much as they could afford to, you know, since there's 62 artists, that was a, a fight with them. And, but stuff like that is what I um, had to, you know, be strong about. But once the book was started, um, they were very, very supportive. Um, a lawyer at, at Abrams told me that she loved the book, you know, she loved the idea of the book. And I mean, just, um, I was working with two women. Um, one was the editor and one was the publicist and later became part editor. And they were, um, I sometimes had to fight for things, but it was fine. It yeah. really, the really important things I didn't have to fight for. And they let me put it together completely the way I wanted. That was really important. That's fantastic. Had you shopped it around to many publishers or? No. Yeah. I actually knew about um, that Abrams had a comic arts program, um, or not a program, but a, a publishing, 
yeah arm that was for comics and and my husband had a book through them so I knew the name of an editor and I just asked him you know are you interested in doing a book about this I didn't have um I didn't even have the title you know I, I just had the idea yeah and well, they, they were very interested I'm glad they recognized how essential it is I mean it's yeah, and it's it's a gorgeously put together book. I, I I'll switch to um, asking some questions for the artists, and in order to avoid that Zoom chaos of speaking over each other, we'll kind of go in order of how we're appearing on the screen. So we'll start with Joyce, then go to Ebony and Carta. So I'm curious about um, when when invited to contribute by Diane, uh, was there any hesitation about whether or not you wanted to accept? No, I. I had had an experience many years ago before I ever started cartooning. And I thought, that's a, that's a really interesting thing to write about. You know, you don't see that very often. So I decided to do it. It just came. I just told the story just like it happened, hmm. including the weird ending. <laughs> 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 Being asked out to dinner by, <laughs> by my rapist. <laughs> Well, he felt pretty guilty because he had picked the wrong person. He he thought it was he thought I was somebody else, and mm. I thought he was somebody else for a brief moment. So, uh, <laughs> but I I kept, didn't keep his name. I have no idea. Mm. I I don't want to know. It's gone from my mind except for this story, and it did not upset me to do this story because it had happened what forty five or so years before. Yeah. So long time. Ebony, what about you? Any hesitation? Uh, no. Um, trying to remember around the time. Uh, no, I was actually delighted because, um, I mean, I just started making comics. Uh, I'm almost 40 now, and I started making comics when I was 31. So if, you know, if you want to make a comic, you know, people ask me, I'm always like delighted and honored because it's not a, a thing that, you know, happens regularly for me. So I was like, yeah, sure. And then um, when I saw the topic, fortunately, I had a lot of options to choose from. Um, and I chose this, that particular story immediately pops in my head because of uh the thing that happened afterwards when I, I ran down to uh, my coworker's uh, place, she's the librarian. And then we just got into this really weird conversation about Keanu Reeves. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, well, I can, I think I can do that. And the, like, I don't know if uh, Diane, if you gave us like a page allotment, but it was like, I could do this as a short story and make it like coherent enough um, where people would kind of get a sense of what was going on. So that's why I chose um, chose that one. But yeah, no, I had no hesitation. I have hesitation with reading the story, but doing it um, and saying yes to it, no, not at all. What about you, Carter? Mm, no, also no hesitation. I mean, I was deeply honored to be asked, like Diane is someone whose work I've enjoyed my whole life um and also i was very pleased to be asked to contribute to you know an all women anthology because it's still fairly common that like trans people might not be asked to contribute to to something like this um so no i was i was very pleased and i mean unfortunately also had like a wealth of options um to choose from so um, yeah, no hesitation. Yeah, and I'm building off of that. I'm curious about whether, and Joyce, you, you kind of answered this already, but whether you all knew immediately what story you wanted to tell. I know, you know, I can remember very vividly, and I think there's a few stories that even go into this within Drawing Power of when all of the posts were going up online of people with the, with the Me Too hashtag that I had to take some time to really think about what of the many experiences 
which one I wanted to share and how horrifying that is that you'd even have to, you know, curate which, which of your traumatic, awful experiences to put out there. So I'm curious about if you all knew immediately which one you wanted to tell and if there was a specific reason why you wanted to tell that story. Joyce? Oh, well, I believe I knew immediately because it's the one that stood out to me, but at my age and having been uh, nubile since I was, uh, since about 1953 or younger, uh, I've had a whole career until the last 15 or 20 years of batting off people I didn't want to deal with. And so, and, and my family taught me how to do this when I was very young, like eight years old or so. So I always knew I could say no. And I think the strength that that gave me kept me from having a lot of the horrible experiences that I saw in drawing power. Hmm. I, I've, I've been strong all my life and I just got stronger by, by the experiences. I love it. Yeah. But it still have... happens. I mean, you can't, you couldn't grow up. You couldn't, you couldn't walk the earth without getting hit on by people you didn't want to deal with. Nope. It couldn't happen. Anybody else agree on that or what's it what, yeah. I think I'm probably the oldest person in the room, but uh, you know, I, I think it was just a uh, something that happened to women always. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it happens to men too, but <laughs> maybe men don't want to talk about it so easily. <laughs> Ebony, did you know immediately which story you wanted to tell? And was there a yeah. reason that brought you to that one? Um, just that I felt like I could tell it in a coherent way and and um, short enough to fit the um, the time the time frame. I think that was I think it gave us a lot of time actually to to do the yeah. comic a couple months. Um, but I had so with the dimensions like I wanted to work a little bit bigger so I could shrink it down. So I was, and my I don't have a great scanner so. I was, the way I think is like, okay, what kind of panels could I make? And then how can I make it scan easily <laughs> on like a, a, a shitty scanner? <laughs> and so without thinking about all those things, it was like, okay, well, if I just do a simple grid, um, anyway, th so I was just thinking more about the, like the technical aspects of it. Um, and, and I thought that this would make the most sense. Like I could do a, like a, kind of pacing that would work for a democratic grid with this story hmm. um but i didn't think too much about it really i just kind of did it i think the hardest part for me was just like sitting down and actually doing it um because i knew that i would i would be like an angry person uh for a while while i was doing it like just kind of like in a grumpy mood um and so there was never really a right time to like to do it so I just told everyone around me like I'm working on this story and it happened uh 2003 I think it happened and so it, it had been a while but you know I hadn't told anyone about it and it was one of like something I was pretty uh ashamed of still like back um when I was like making it like because I hadn't told anyone so so yeah so I had to tell people like I'm, I'm making this story and it's about sexual assault so if I'm uh an asshole you know why so um that's the only thing i had to do was just like tell people so i could just sit down and then do it mm -hmm. but once i started working on it it was it just came out so what about what about you um i originally i had a broader scope in mind um partly because i wanted to take as much money from Abrams as possible. Um, I originally like asked Diane for like 20 pages, you know, something something more than she was uh, able to give. Um, and she very um, reasonably told me that given the number of artists, she could only spare, you know, however many six pages or, or whatever it ended up being. So um, I narrowed the scope a little bit, but. I had a pretty clear idea from the beginning. 
And, you know, you've all done a variety of auto bio work in general outside of this. And I'm curious about if there are any, you know, specific storytelling choices that you have to make when you are considering how to put such difficult and personal work out there. (laughs) Diane, do you want to start? Well, I think it is incredibly difficult. Almost, well, a great majority of the artists told me during the process of doing these stories that it was the hardest story they'd ever done. Mm -hmm. Because like you, Ebony, they hadn't really thought about it or people are ashamed, they're embarrassed and ashamed that somehow somebody tried to rape you and that's embarrassing and shameful. So I had, there were certain trends that I saw. Some people hadn't, said anything about it for 30 years and then they're crying at the end with their therapist. And that wasn't, that was normal. I mean, it was very important to me to have young, young people too. So I've, I put in two of my students from SVA who were very talented. And that was great because they were like the youngest was like 20 probably. Mm-hmm. And, um, I I think I don't think it's easy for anybody to to write this stuff, and I mean sometimes it's cathartic. I thought maybe Carter's story was cathartic, and even though it was disgusting, <laughs> but um, I really like that everybody had a different approach. You know. Yeah. Joyce, do you feel like you had to make any specific choices about how to tell a story like this? No, on this story, it had happened so long ago and uh, uh, there was nothing that I had to hide about it. Mm. You know, nothing that I felt ashamed about it because the whole thing was this horrible accident. And uh, compared to the other stories in the book, I got off really lightly. Um, But what it did do, I think I mentioned in the last uh, panel, was that it made me feel vulnerable. And that feeling has never left me. Yeah. So, and I, I, as a result of feeling vulnerable, I married way too quickly somebody I probably shouldn't have married. And that brought on a whole set of other problems, but that's for another time. (laughs) (laughs) It really was influential then. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, even though I was not physically damaged or anything, I I mentally realized that I could not walk the earth unmolested. (laughs) It it just, it was something that was going to happen. It did happen. And, you know, it was awful. I certainly locked my doors. I'm very, very careful about locking doors now. (laughs) Always have been. Ebony, what about you? And I'm also curious to hear from you guys too. Like, you know, was the process cathartic? Was it re-traumatizing? You you spoke a little bit to having to give everyone a heads up that you might not be in a good mood for a little while, but did it feel good to get this on paper? Um, I I don't know if it, it, I can't remember if I felt good. Um, I think like in the process of like drawing it, um, I think I get more absorbed into like the storytelling aspects of it and more of like the technical sides of making comics. And so uh, that happens with a lot of my stories and and even while I'm making the story, there's a little bit of, I'm deeply, like absorbed in what I'm doing but I'm also dissociating a little bit from it because there's always um some amount of like measuring like I have to measure this and that I have to think about um for this one I I just did high contrast black and white because again my scanner wasn't great so it only picks up like black or white (laughs) um and yeah so that's what I paid attention to more I think uh, I shared. I initially shared it with other folks before I sent it sent it in, um, and that was a little strange because I sent it. I showed it to like you know 
people I've been friends with for over 20 years and I had never mentioned um, this this mm-hmm. moment or this time um, and so yeah talking about talking about that I mean it was it was fine I mean we again we're we've been friends for a very long time but it was just you know you think you know people and then mm-hmm. and then they say something new to you but yeah. yeah, I mean, I think the Me, Me Too movement in general and this book for a lot of people feels like an invitation to actually share this stuff for the first time and to and to, to see other people sharing it. And then that feeling that, yeah, I, I mean, you know, good is not the word to describe the feeling, but there is something really comforting and cathartic and about it to know, sadly, to know that you're not alone and how prevalent it is. I do, I do want to mention that it was appreciative that Diane uh, was putting this together um, because I, I do remember saying like to a friend of mine when this whole Me Too thing came out, it was, oh, it's just for like those like pretty celebrities. Like no one really cares about, like I was a school teacher, like no one cares about regular people <laughs> and like, you know, the, the shit we have to go through every day. And so uh, I was, I, I do remember feeling very appreciative that uh, Dan uh, was creating this platform for for more regular people um, and for the more um, mundane aspects. I think of sexual assault that can happen. There are there are these uh, like um, very intense moments, but I think there's also an everydayness. Like the moment you step outside your door, I think for most people, you're exposing yourself and you're leaving yourself vulnerable for anything to happen and I think the book captures that well yeah Kurta what about you how did you find the process of getting this out there um I I don't necessarily know if I would find it as I say I found it cathartic but something that I I have found about drawing um kind of explicit comics about trauma is that um because I have to concentrate so much when I'm drawing whatever happened, the memory of drawing it almost supersedes the memory of the event in my mind. Yeah. Um, so now when I think about, you know, the, the thing that I wrote in, in drawing power about, I think of the drawings I made more than I do of the like physical reality of the situation. And that is something, you know, that, I don't know if it, it it's necessarily good or bad, but like it certainly dulls it a little bit, you know, through retelling that story, it robs the event of a little bit of its immediacy because you have created sort of like a mental um, barrier between you and like the actual physical event, um, which is partly why I always lean into being very explicit when I'm drawing things like this is that like, the more explicit I can be and the more detailed I can be about the things that disgust me the most, the more likely I am to feel like I'm, I'm kind of superseding the actual, you know, the actual memory with like the memory of drawing it or the memory of retelling that story in some way. Absolutely. And yeah, that's a very, very interesting idea. And makes a complete sense. It's an unburdening when you do that. And also, leads well into my next question. I'm curious, even though I know this is kind of broad, of like why comics? And this is a question for all of you. You know, is there something unique about the medium of comics that you feel like helps explore these kinds of experiences and, and autobio in general? Deanne, do you want to start with that? I think, you know, words and pictures, that's what comics are. And, and they really have, they do have an immediacy that gets to people. Um, it's not just the written word and it's a combination and it's very effective. It's an effective teaching tool, you know. Um, for me, I've always loved comics. So, you know, I can't answer for everybody else, but um, I think it, it is a natural way to express yourself and to reach people. That's it. Joyce, what about you? Well, 
uh, I was thinking about your question earlier because I knew you were going to ask it. I had an idea you were going to ask it. And the thing is that I don't think I could write on a piece of paper, a bunch of words and have it make any sense. I, I apparently I think in comics mm. and like Diane, I've been reading comics since I was about a year old. I have pictures of my father and I reading the Sunday paper. So it must be so ingrained in me that if I'm to create something, it has to be this way. <laughs> don't know. A, I don't know any other answer there. Just, sure. just it just, I can't express myself any other way. Ebony, what do you think? Uh, so like I mentioned before, I, I started late. I never read comics as a kid. Uh, I thought it was something that white people did, um, <laughs> if I'm honest. And it wasn't until I was about in uh, 2012 uh, when I was getting my PhD, I uh, took a class Actually, I was getting my master's, but I, was, I took a class um, with a cartoonist, Linda Berry. She was an artist in residence, and I didn't know her at a time again because I don't know, I didn't know comics. And so I was looking for an alternative way to um, present, represent my qualitative research I was doing at the time about the education system in Angola. And um, and at that time, we were doing a lot of writing, and I just found the way, it was more of the way she taught that really, because I, you know, was a teacher, and that's where the background was coming from, and her approach to teaching um, anything, you know, but her approach to teaching, like, writing and storytelling was, was something uh, very refreshing for me, and so um, I don't necessarily I wouldn't say that this is the only way I could tell this story but it's um making comics just feels really good and I just like the feeling I I have it's a very like a physical reaction I have while I'm making comics and it's literally like you know I use an ink brush and so I just like the feeling of that movement and it's very for me it's very addicting and so um that's why I, I just choose uh, to continue making comics and telling stories through this way. I think you can do it with really anything, but it's just what whatever works for um, for that particular person. Yeah, and I just wanted to add a comment that came in into the chat. And I'll also mention for everyone watching, uh, you, if you do have questions for our panelists, you can put those into the Q&A function at any time. But in the chat, um, someone mentioned, you know, the process of retelling in detail is used regularly in therapy for PTSD survivors of traumatic events. So it makes, you know, obviously absolute sense that it would help put some distance between the memory and what's on the paper. Um, so this is, you know, a little bit of a, a shift in subject, but I do think it's a really important thing to talk about. Um, I'm interested since we have people here who are, you know, uh, a, a newer generation of <laughs> comics creators and some some comics veterans among us. Um, just thinking about the comic scene and industry then and now. Um, thanks in part to the Me Too movement, we're definitely seeing more of this kind of behavior that we've been discussing, sexual assault uh, within the comics industry, finally being called out and identified and seeing people finally losing their jobs after years and years of harassment or worse and actually being held accountable. Um, so I'm really curious to hear uh, first from Diane and Joyce about just general observations and any you know differences and similarities or specific stories you'd want to share about the climate today working in comics compared to working in it in the 70s and 80s. First, uh, well. Uh, First of all, I'm not in the comics particularly. I just work at home and then I send something off. But I, my experience the last, oh, 10 years or so where I've been more in groups and, and uh, dealing with it is that the situation is much more equal out there. Uh, when I first started doing comics in 1972 or 73, there were a bunch of well-known cartoonists living here in in Laguna Beach, where I live now. And they, 
except for one of them, they were very dismissive and even sometimes quite cruel. Hmm. And I just stayed away from them. And uh, the one who was nice to me, I stayed friends with him. Um, uh, and it was a lifetime friendship. He died uh, a number of years ago, but I remember him fondly because he was willing. He was he was a sexist pig, really. But but he was he was willing to make an exception for people he felt should. I, who knows? I don't know. Things were so weird back then. I, I, I put it on the back shelf and I forget all about it. I don't think about it anymore. <laughs> But but I, I really think things are better now. There's been a generation or two of people who have grown up with more with the idea of equality. Mm -hmm. And I, I know my son is sort of uh, an equality person, whether he knows it or not. And, and a few months ago, I said, you do realize you were raised in a feminist household. And he looked at me like I was from Mars. <laughs> But, but uh, yeah, he'd never thought about it before. He'd just been jerked up by his mother, you know. But there we are. But I, I do think things have changed. Do you agree, Diane? I think things have changed. And I think the Me Too movement was a huge part of it, the change that made more and more women, even whether cartoonists or whether, you know, whatever, they just had to tell their story and they felt, I don't know if they felt better from sharing it, but they felt they got it out. And I think that's a real important part of it. Yeah. Um, I remember, um, I don't really remember, I think I was I was lucky. I don't remember much harassment um, from men when I was starting. Um, actually, I was in women's comics and they called it a collective and, um, I tried going to some meetings and things like that, but it didn't really work for me. And I had to, Aileen Kaminsky and I went out and did our own comic. And that was with um, Last Gasp, Ron Turner. And I had heard all these stories about Ron Turner um, being very gropey and I don't know, but it didn't happen. You know, nothing like that happened to us. So I can't say firsthand. And I think in a lot of ways, he was very supportive. Dory Seda worked for him. Mm -hmm. And um, and he published Twisted Sisters, which was, you know, sold like 12 copies in, <laughs> or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. so, and then when I went to, I wanted to, um, I edited a comic book called Let Me Out of Here. Um, and the printment was a, a couple, Bob and Peggy Rita, and um, they just agreed to do it. it. I think it was sort of the time, it was still the 70s, and if you did work, you could get it published, mostly. <laughs> I mean, the first thing I got published, I had it the wrong way. I did it horizontal instead of vertical. <laughs> Collector's item now. <laughs> Carta and Ebony, is there anything that you guys want to add about that or reflecting on what we've seen in our industry recently? Ebony. You don't want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go. In, uh, so like I said before, I'm new to this, so I don't really know like what happened before or even what's going on now but um i think that the industry is still very white and it's still very male and it's still very heteronormative and i still think there's this kind of certain aesthetic that um a lot of uh publishers and perhaps cartoonists and, and fans look for um, and I, and I think that certain aesthetic again has this proximity to, um, beauty standards that are, uh, this, uh, proximity to whiteness and heteronormativity. And, um, I think for, um, black people and other people of color, um, 
queer people, gay people, trans people who make their own comics and represent not necessarily themselves or represent characters that reflect, you know, aspects of themselves. It's, it might be, and it, I know I've had some issues with this too, but it, it's, there is this kind of difficulty around other people who aren't used to like black people drawing other black people, for example, to get used to how that might come out in like drawing certain stories in a way. Um, because again, there, it's just uh, this uh, industry is uh, used to a certain kind of aesthetic. Um, and, and I think it's, I guess it's, good that there are like when I go to comic events now there's a lot more there are there are more black people there that I'm that that I thought that there would be like when I was at SPX I was just like wow there's a lot of black people I was just like really shocked I was like wow there's a lot of black people here um and so I guess um that's that's good and um and I also think it's helpful that there are a lot of different ways to get your stories out there and it's easy or to like disseminate your work. So if you can't go through these kind of like publishing channels um, that you can kind of, you can still self-publish, you can do Kickstarter or you can do whatever, you can just post on Instagram and, and find your audience because, you know, there's a lot of is it like seven billion people in the world or more? So there, there is an audience for your work. Um, I don't necessarily know that it's all supported by the publishing world. Mm. But again, I'm new to this, so I also have a very yeah. limited knowledge. You have fresh eyes, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Carter, what about you? Um, I definitely agree with with everything Ebony is saying. Like, obviously, I wasn't. Um, alive yet in the 70s, but from um, everything I understand and have read, like things have gotten substantially better. You know, I think it's less, there's less of like an emphasis on publishing things that are shocking for the sake of being shocking and shocking meaning like intensely violent against women or homophobic or racist or, you know, like you, you don't see the same sort of massively popular, you know, like shock value stuff as much anymore. I, I do think we've moved past that as an industry. I do think that the parts of the industry that still make money are like deeply fucked and reprehensible and, you know, controlled by people who I don't, particularly trust which makes something like drawing power like a huge breath of fresh air that it came out from a major publisher that it was organized in such a wonderful way that it had proper editorial standards and like control in the hands of diane and not you know like some anonymous big publisher person um i think that for young artists you know the thing is self-publishing as, as ebony mentioned and also like finding and uplifting like the kind of work that they want to see. Um, publishing with small presses and just working to create the work that that's currently missing. Mm -hmm. um, I think slowly things might be getting better, you know, mm -hmm. cross. So we've got um, about 10 minutes left. So I'm, and we have a couple of questions that have come into the Q and A. So I'll switch over to uh, audience questions for a minute. Uh, this is a question I think uh, specifically for Diane. Um, <clears throat> someone asks, did the process of editing such material become overwhelming to you? Yes and no. Uh, the fact is that um, the stories came in slowly. You know, it wasn't an avalanche all at once that I had to go through. So um, it did build up, though, it just built to the sense of urgency because some of the stories were so horrifying and others just rem reminders that we live in this hostile environment like Joyce was talking about that or and in this book Brina Nunez was like talking about what it felt like to leave her house mm -hmm. you know and 
be in a specific community where men are used to, um, you know, whistling or making weird co comments and being very invasive. And she realized that her family could have done that, her uncles or, you know, brother. And she still had to cope with how it felt to be out there. And then there's a sense of relief when you get back inside your house. And then of course, there's all these stories about people have done about horrible things that happened in their houses. So, I mean, it's a very, I didn't realize a couple of things. I didn't realize how prevalent it was, um, even though I sort of knew it, especially from Me Too, but getting all these stories, it was overwhelming in that sense, emotionally kind of overwhelming. Yeah. It almost, as awful as this is gonna sound, it almost surprised me that you had anyone tell you that they hadn't had an experience of this nature. I know that you said, how many people did you, do you think you um, reached out to? More than were in the book, I, I can't say. Um, Exactly, but probably a hundred at least. Yeah. And having just one person say, well, this never happened to me. I had some people say, well, it happened. And I thought they were really great cartoonists, but they weren't ready to deal with it. They weren't ready to do a story about it. Yeah, understandable. And I think this is a, a question for everybody. Um, did you have, did you have to self care to navigate the process of creating your comic. So any, any ways that you felt you took care of yourself or tips for taking care of yourself while working on and sharing such difficult material? I can answer this one. Um, I think it's important to let yourself walk away from it um, when you need to and not to force yourself or push yourself when you're making especially difficult work, you know, um, the work will still be there. You have the time and it's good to give yourself the space because it doesn't help anybody, um, especially you, if you push yourself into re-traumatized spaces. Um, I know that when I'm drawing hard work like this, I have to like get up and stretch and like stare into space, you know, a fair amount. And, and I think it's just important to build that time in um, and not be hard on yourself for doing that. Yeah. Anyone else wanna to add to that? I think it has to be the right time in your life that you can do it. That's all. A lot of times it just isn't, it isn't the right time and you can't deal with it. I'm glad, I'm really glad that so many people were willing to deal with it. And I think it took a huge amount of courage for everybody to do these stories. And I don't know, I, I, I feel that, that everybody is saying this book is important and I'm really glad because what I want is for it to disseminate out into the world. And there are so many places that are worse than here, you know? That's for sure. And in a way, I was sorry I, I didn't add men to this book because I understand there are plenty of men that get sexually harassed. And, but I didn't feel comfortable uh, reaching out to them. It's like, I know a lot of men cartoonists. I can't imagine going up to them and saying, okay, so were you sexually harassed? As <laughs> somehow didn't come make any sense to me. I couldn't do it. Yeah. Actually, on that note, I'm curious about what the reception has been like for the book. What kind of feedback have you gotten, both positive and negative, if there's any negative? Well, you know, I thought I might get negative uh, emails and things. I might have to change my email address or something. I haven't gotten that. I guess it hasn't gone out into the world um, to these men's groups that hate women, you know, but I was a little scared and I haven't had anything like that. And I've had very, very good reactions from um, the artists within the book and 
we, we did book signings. This was, you know, in the time when you could still interact with the world. And I went to LA and San Francisco and Chicago and, you know, did signings. And in some, some places, they were very, there weren't a lot of people. One time, I think it was in LA, the whole audience was men. What now? <laughs> it was very strange. And I, some of them were gay men, which made more sense to me somehow, but um, they weren't hostile. They were like, maybe they were dragged there by a friend or something. I don't know. But the way it worked out was there were primarily men in the audience. And that was very interesting. Sure. I mean, I think, you know, between Twisted Sisters and Drawing Power, seems like you have mastered the anthology form, especially for getting women's stories out there. Do you, are there any other anthology ideas that you have brewing for the future? Well, right now I'm just like, I know that I could find another 62 or 60, 620 or 6,200 women out there. There's such an explosion of cartoonists that are, that's a big difference actually from the 70s and 80s to now that there's like this incredible community of women cartoonists that I see on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And it's really, shocked me and I you know I was really happy to, to find it and not just you know find it here and try to find different people from different backgrounds here but like in Finland there's a feminist collective and in Russia they have women they're doing stories you know it's just um, really worldwide and I would have loved to have something like that that showed that even more but I don't know if I can deal with it again. <laughs> I mean, it just seems like an unbelievable amount of work to have pulled this all together. It's it's amazing. And I want to thank you for doing it. Uh, we're, we're in our last minute here, but um, thank you all for being part of this panel, uh, for discussing this in a, you know, in a public venue and for contributing to Drawing Power. Thank you, Diane, for making Drawing Power. Is there anything, any last things that any of you want to share or, or talk about? I just want to say I'm so glad to meet people I haven't met yet, like Carta and Ebony. And that was the biggest thing about going to all these book signings was I'd get a different group of cartoonists who lived in that area, you know, to come and get really close to some of them. And it was like I have this dream that everybody in this book could be in one room. <laughs> we could all meet each other. That's it. I love that. Well, thank you all so much for joining us and thanks everyone for tuning in.